quickly while we wait for <laughs> Facebook to continue. Mr. Irving, can I call you John or would you prefer I call you Mr. Irving? Okay, I just wanted to make sure. All right, everybody. Well, this is a most, most exciting evening. Hello and welcome to A Mighty Blaze. I am Jenna Blum, one of the co-founders. We are so excited to welcome you to this initiative that helps writers connect with readers in the age of COVID and beyond. Tonight, we are thrilled beyond belief to bring you Caroline Levitt, our other co-founder and New York Times bestseller, talking with the incomparable, iconic, Mr. John Irving, who has so graciously agreed to give us some of his time this evening. I am going to introduce Caroline and then she will take it away. Caroline Lovett, in addition to being the co-founder of A Mighty Blaze, is the New York Times bestselling author of 12 novels. Her latest, Wither Without You, will be published August 4th, 2020 from Algonquin Books, along with a 10th anniversary edition of her novel, pictures of you. Caroline and John, enjoy your conversation. We're so excited to hear you chat. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you. Okay, so I'm the co-founder of Mighty Blaze and I'm thrilled to be here with you, John, and I'm just gonna read a brief intro of you. You're a wrestler, a beer lover, a New England aficionado, and one of the most legendary writers we have. You published your first novel, Setting Free the Bears, when you were just 26 years old, but it was your fourth novel, The World According to Garp, which became not just an international bestseller, but a phenomenon. And I want to show again. Whoops, the cover just came off. Oh, no. <laughs> this is my very first cover of The World According to Garp, the very first edition Those of the paperback. That's terrible. <laughs> I'll have to attach it. He's a National Book Award winner. Um, the World According to Garb was later made into a wonderful film with War, War, look, Robin Williams, Glenn Close, and John Lithgow, garnering Oscar nominations and offering John Irving a cameo as a referee in one of Garb's wrestling matches. We should have had that cameo right here. He's the author of so many wonderful, amazing books, The Hotel New Hampshire, The Cider House Rules, both made into great movies, A Prayer for Owen Meany, a Son of the Circus, A Widow for One Year, The Fourth Hand, Until I Find You, Last Night in Twisted River, In One Person, An Avenue of Mysteries. Irving has had four novels reach number one on the bestseller list of the New York Times. The Hotel New Hampshire, which stayed number one for seven incredible weeks and was in the top 15 for over 27 weeks. The Sire House Rules, A Widow for One Year, and The Fourth Hand were also bestsellers. In 1999, after 13 years in development, which shows you how movies work, Irving's screenplay for the Cider House Rules were made into an incredible film directed by Lassie Hallstrom, starring Michael Caine, Tony McGuire, Charlize Theron, and Delroy Lindo. Irving also made another cameo appearance as the disapproving schoolmaster, which must have been fun. The film was amazing moving, and it was nominated for seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture. It earned Irving an Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay. It also won the Maggie Award from Planned Parenthood for Exceptional Achievement in the area of reproductive rights. Irving has won two Lambda Literary Awards for his achievement, achievements in the area of LGBTQ rights as well. We are beyond delighted at the Mighty Blies, and yes, more than a little awestruck, to be truthful, to welcome John Irving. Thank you for being here, John. Thank you. Okay, so my first question is that what I really love about your books is while they are wildly entertaining, laugh out loud funny, and they make you cry, to me, they have this deep moral center that elevates them from an ordinary reading experience. It seems to me that this moral question is always about love. What does it mean to love somebody, to connect with another person, or to be truly human in the world? Can you talk about that? I think I was very fortunate that um, although I was a, a, a slow reader, um, uh, later diagnosed as a, a, a dyslexic uh, reader. 
I had a, a very classical literary uh, education. I, I grew up reading um, the old stuff, um, the, the classical Greek dramas, Shakespeare, the 19th century novel, many novels in translation. And, and the models of the form for me really became those 19th century novels, which came from the Greeks, mm -hmm. and from Shakespeare, where the structure of the storytelling, the architecture of the novel was as meaningful as the architecture uh, of a play. But most of all, these novels were meant to have an emotional and a psychological, not just an intellectual uh, effect mm -hmm. uh, on a reader. The, these were my models. Most of my contemporaries hated them because they were the books they were compelled to read in school. Right. But in my case, by the time I got to so-called modern literature, especially to, at the time, the contemporary canon of American literature, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Faulkner, I felt really ho-hum. I didn't care. Um, I felt a little doomed as a writer, uh, commercially speaking, uh, even as a teenager, because my models were these writers that all my contemporaries hated. Um, I, in other words, I was old fashioned before I began. Uh, but I started writing, imitating as all writers do, like painters. I, I started imitating those 19th century writers when I was a teenager. Um, but guess what? Nobody's gonna, call you out for imitating Dickens or Hardy or Thomas Mann uh, or Flaubert because they won't recognize it. The language- oh, That's right. You're never gonna be exposed. So that although I felt I was certainly doomed to obscurity, um, for most of my contemporaries who wanted to be writers, who were imitating Hemingway, not only was it awful, because in my judgment, Hemingway was awful, but everyone knew who they were copying. Right. It was evident. Right. Uh, you know, it um, looked like, sounded like, smelled like Hemingway. Well, so I, I, I didn't kind of know at, at first how lucky I was. But add to that, the love word you use, well, Another, what I thought at the time was a misfortune. The fact that um, I, uh, I got someone pregnant and um, we, we got married and I had a baby when I was still an undergraduate. Wow. Uh, I was barely older than 22 when my first a child was born. Um, I was still in college. I felt exceedingly sorry for myself. But I also realized that a person had come in to my life that I incontrovertibly loved and wanted to protect. And I suddenly had something uh, to be afraid for. And that became such an important element of my writing. Uh, not just as you say, the, the connection to characters you care about and, and love, but the fear of losing them. Exactly. And, and, and so, uh, with the with with the birth of, of my um, 
first child, uh, I um, I I got the part about loving someone that means living with the fear of something going wrong, living with the fear of something happening to them. Um, and I quite consciously tried to transcribe that feeling, the fear of losing someone you love to my characters, to the characters I was writing about. You know, that's a terror of most people. And I think part of your brilliance is that you do write about it because that's sort of like most people don't want to touch that. They're so afraid of that. Which brings me to my next question, which is, you've said that everywhere in your writing, there has to be an element where you're writing something you're afraid of writing, that you dread the idea of living with. Because without that fear or dread, how much could the novel hope to have an emotional or psychological effect on a reader? That's something you're conscious of, like asking the question, what's the part of this novel I'm going to really hate writing? But in writing about these parts, do you feel in any way that once you write about it, that you've purged that fear or dread or controlled it in any way? Or do you just feel like it's something you have to do? Uh, those are two questions. Um, I know, I'm sorry, I bunched the first, them in together. The, the first one's a little easier. Um, yes, there has to be, there has to be an element in every book that I'm afraid of, afraid of happening to me or to anyone I, I care about. Mm -hmm. And with that, there, uh, I, I have to know before I begin the part of the book that I'm really dreading writing, that almost makes me feel sick or, or squeamish to think I'm gonna have to write that scene. If you do this, if you make that happen, you're going to have to write that. And, right. and un, until I know what that element of the story is, I never start. It has to be there. Um, and uh, But I have <laughs> never imagined writing as therapy. It, it, if it were for me, it doesn't work. <laughs> because I don't purge anything. Right. Okay. I just go back to it. You go back. <laughs> I, I, just, I just do it again. I, the, the terrible things I, I do to my characters, especially to, to children and other loved ones within a family, uh, I do them again. Um, they don't go away. Um, so there is, there, there's no, I, I know that, that there's supposed to be something as old as Aristotle um, and as um, you know, uh, popular as television miniseries uh, is something of a catharsis that- Yeah, let, purging the pity and terror. Um, well, um, it doesn't happen to this writer. Um, they, um, I, I feel pretty familiar with the things that make me afraid, and I, 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 I don't, I don't <laughs> lessening or to any degree going away. They, they don't, um, they don't abate those things. They, they just come back. They just um, come back. No, you don't. I, I've, I've actually put this in writing before. You don't, you don't get to choose your obsessions. Right. They choose you. That's right. You, you don't. You, you don't choose your obsessions any more than you get to pick your nightmares. Right. And they're, sometimes they're so, one and the same. The, the reason so many nightmares are recurrent is that you have no choice. Right. But they 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 wait. They just wait there. So how do you get yourself to write those horrible things? Does it just reach a point where you're so compelled that you well, have you know, to I write it? Feel, I, I feel very strongly that if there isn't something like that in the story, then 
why is a stranger going to have a stake in it? Right. Like a okay. psychological stake. Why, why are they going to feel there's any uh, thing at stake for them? Right. Uh, in reading this, if that's, if, if that's not um, existent, if that's not um, uh, present, um, it's um, uh, maybe in uh, maybe in that sense, it's uh, if it isn't cathartic, um, if there isn't anything that that is truly sort of purged uh, by it, um, uh, you know, maybe it's just like maybe it's just like crying. <laughs> Um, sometimes you got to do it, you know, sometimes you do it. Right. That's all. I want to move on to worst case scenarios. Um, since we're talking about how you focus on characters you love and you make things really bad for them. I, I always call that the negation of the negation, making stuff worse. But so in the real world, we have a worst case scenario that's happening us, with us right now with COVID and everything else. Do you feel like art is, is imitating your art at all? And are you imagining even worst case scenarios for us in the world now? You know, it, it, it doesn't matter how bad the contemporary events are. I, 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 I've never been someone as a, as a fiction writer uh, who, who, who writes currently. Um, uh, I purposely set the Cider House rules back at a time before I was born. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't write my Vietnam novel, uh, and, and you know it didn't come out until 1989, a long time after the end of that war, because I uh, that that war affected me, and and uh, and made me uh, so angry that um, I knew I had to wait to to know the difference between. 10, 15 years later, what still made me angry. Right. And the things that had only made me angry at the time because I was angry about everything. <laughs> Those things over time, they, they have a nest, they go away. Do you worry about the world in general though? I mean, do you obsess about the well, future? I, I, think or? I, I think that's an element that's, that's evident. Yeah. In, in in what I write, but you're, mm -hmm. but I I I'm always looking back at the past. Okay. The, the, the subject is the past, and it has to be past enough, right? So that I really know how I feel about it. Okay. Uh, I know the way I feel about it is not going to change, okay. and and so uh, in the. Uh, I've I, I've written about a plague before. I've written about AIDS, and I'm writing about it again. Um, uh, in in my fifteenth novel, in the novel I'm uh, writing now. But I needed to wait a right. long time before I went back uh, to those years and tried to write fiction based on the people whose lives overlapped with mine, the people um, uh, I knew who were uh, lost. Um, uh, so it, I suppose this is consistent with the fact that I begin with endings and I always have. Uh, I, I, I need to know what happens more than uh, a, a last sentence. I need to have the feeling that I'm writing toward something and I know what it is. I, I, I not only need to know what happens, but how it sounds, what's the tone of the sentences, what, um, and 
I think part of that is mechanical. It does have to do with those 19th century novels. It, it has to do with growing up around the theater. Um, you, you were never involved in the, in the production of a play where you didn't know what was gonna happen. I had an acting teacher when I was quite young who, who said, you have, to, you have to know how you're gonna say your last lines before you know how to say your first lines. I love hearing that. I've, I've had different if writers. You, if you don't know how you're going to sound, yeah, yeah. then you might sound that way too soon. And you don't want to sound that way too soon. I've had discussions with... You know, and, and uh, okay, different, um, different art forms, surely acting and, um, and, and writing fiction, but again, those 19th century novels, they, they had a dramatic, a theatrical mm -hmm. uh, structure. The drama of what happened was important. And drama has to be set up. And you can't set something up if you don't know what's going to happen. There's no such thing as foreshadow if you don't know the ending. You know, so that you know, I mean, <laughs> there's a great moment. There's a there's a great moment in in D David Copperfield when Copperfield's nemesis, this older boy who is so cruel to him, who brutalizes him at school, and then who uh, destroys the life of this girl he loves. Um, the terrible Steerforth's body washes up on a beach. Um, and you would think Copperfield and Dickens himself would be elated. We want to be elated. Yes. That, that yes. Here, here's Steerforth. He deserves to be dead on the beach. Um, <laughs> but the line is, I never forgot it. The, 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 the line is, I saw him lying there with his head upon his arm, the way I'd seen him lie at school. And you suddenly realized, oh, this boy hurt Copperfield so much because he loved him. He admired him. He looked up to him. And, um, you know, you can't, you can't, you, you can't get to those levels if you don't know what you're doing when you, when you start. You gotta, you gotta know what's coming. I'm so or happy. I do. Or I do, I, I say this, you know, it, it, it isn't, a, a, a God forbid, when I taught so-called creative writing, I never told my students that they had to know the ending of everything before they wrote. They probably never would have written a word. Um, uh, I don't feel that way that other people should do what I do. And I said this repeatedly for four or five of my books. I always thought this, this habit would change that one day I'd actually begin a book with the beginning instead of the ending. But then I realized it was something I needed to do. At the same time, um, if if I ever got a better ending than the one I had um, uh, pre-designed, I, I would take it. It's not a religion. Okay. Um, I would take the better one. And a couple of times, both with Cider House and with the novel I'm writing now, I've had choices. That is, I've had two endings. That were parallel to e each other for almost the entire writing of the novel. Can you tell us the two endings of Cider House? And I, I couldn't, um, and I couldn't decide. And I thought, well, why not three? The more the merrier. I, <laughs> I'll know when I need to know. Uh, I mean, I didn't sort of uh, fight it. Um, but when I got 
to those last two or three chapters, uh, then I needed to know. And then I got it. I didn't have to, I didn't have to even take a day off and think about it. It just when I was two or three chapters away, one day I woke up and said, Oh, you moron, it has, it has to be, <laughs> you know, it can't be that one. I'll let that go. And um and and uh and that's what happened this time with this with this um I'm I'm in the last three chapters of the novel now and and I was up to the last five chapters with parallel endings. Wow. And a couple of days of the week I would think, okay, it's about time to decide between ending A or ending B. It would help to know. And then, you know, a couple of days later, I knew. And it, again, it was I, I thought, what have you been thinking? I mean, of course it should be. But it was organic. You had to go through both of those parallel roads to find well, out which it, one was the no, right I'm one. No, I'm not going to tell you what the other ending for Cyber. Oh, shoot. Sure. <laughs> you know, that's okay. <laughs> the right one is the wrong. It's the wrong one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so do you ever look back at your books and think, geez, I wish I could rewrite this book because now I'm a different person and I have a different sensibility about the characters in the situation? Or is there anything you wish you had done differently? And no, you don't have to tell me what it is. I just sort of want to know if you ever felt that way now no. that you've changed. No, it, it, certainly not from the perspective of seeing myself or imagining myself as a different person now. Okay. But there is a there is a categorical difference uh, in the management of the architecture of the whole story, the, the, the structure of the whole chronology of the storytelling. There is a difference between those novels I wrote when I was teaching English and coaching wrestling uh, full time, and I had two, three hours a day max to write, and not every day. That's not a lot. And then those novels post the world according to Gar, when I had seven, eight hours a day, uh, and I, I I know that difference. But I would never willingly go back uh, to and even read a so-called old novel. If it weren't for the adaptation process, the adapting of novel to film or mm -hmm. novel to television, that has been a part of my life from the beginning. Without that necessary reason to look back or go back to a book you finished, um, I don't know that I ever reread my but um, when you're looking at it as an adaptation it's to look for maybe oh what was that scene where i i told the reader almost everything but i left out that part i might go back to look for some specific thing mm -hmm. but to, to go back and reread an old novel mm, no um and in fact relatively recently uh when I was led back to the world according to Garp because of a miniseries that, that has uh, evolved. Well, I realized then that usually when you adapt one of your books for film, it happens fairly quickly after you've written it. The, the process of adapting it or not mm -hmm. either happens of, upon the novel's publication or shortly after it, or it doesn't happen at all. And, and so there hasn't been a great deal of time passing to give you a perspective on what you might do differently. Right. I think this was a part of the difficulty I faced when I was adapting the Cider House Rules because I began adapting the Cider House Rules 
as a film almost immediately upon finishing it as a novel. And that process with four directors over 13 years, I, I, I think it was as difficult for me as it was because um, there was very little about the novel I wanted to change on screen. The burden was always what I would choose to leave out and how I would fill the gap of what I'd left out. That was always the difficulty. It was years later because I declined to write the screenplay mm -hmm. according to Gar when I was first asked in the Why? Why? Troy Hill. I knew how I knew George. We were friends. Um, we remained friends. But he did not see that film as I did. And I knew we okay. never agree about it. And it would be uh, an uphill fight and he'd win. He would get what he wanted. Um, and uh, I would just feel um, that the, the film I saw was, uh, was not going to be made. So it was, it was actually an, uh, my fondness for George notwithstanding, my, my personal fondness for him, uh, I think it was a good decision. I think I would have been happy if I'd, um, if I'd been on set trying to fight that out with him. Um, but when Warner Brothers Television came to me only a few years ago and said, what do you think about this as a miniseries? Well, I found myself going back to a book that I hadn't read in a long time. And in my view, it was so badly constructed. Wow. It, it, it so much reflected not another person, but someone who, who really didn't know enough about the architecture of his own story to know when to begin it um, and what to leave out and mm -hmm. when to bring it in. Uh, and so I wrote five episodes of a miniseries more easily than I had ever written a single draft of the Cider House Rules, because I found it easy to, to look at the chronology of the novel and say, no, 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 that's not how you want to see it. You, you don't tell this story in a linear fashion. Um, you know, visually, that's not how you should get it. Um, and, and I realized I was, of course, going back to a model I had once tried to sell George Roy Hill. And, and George had just looked at me and said, I remember at the time, he looked, he was very funny. He looked at me at the time and said, nah. he said, Warner Brothers would never buy that. <laughs> and, and I said, I said, I said, you don't buy that. He said, you're right, I don't buy that. <laughs> so that's what it would be like, you know? That's <laughs> <laughs> so it was a good thing I said no and, and, and but, so okay that's the only instance of going back that I know <laughs> is because of you know the, the fact that uh, writing screenplays has been a part of my writing life from the publication of my first novel mm -hmm. and although that screenplay was never made and I was terribly bitter about that experience and thought I'm never gonna do this again. To take two years away from writing a novel to, to do all this work on a film that's never made. And this great old guy who was the director I was working with, Irvin Kirshner, who made, I think, um, the best of, this, of the Star Wars films, The Empire Strikes Back. Um, uh, Kirshner said, don't worry kid, you learned something. <laughs> and I thought, really? Well, I learned something I thought I never wanted to do again. But he was right. 
He taught me, that man taught me how to write a screenplay. We spent two years um, in Vienna um, working on setting Free the Bears and then Columbia Pictures in the UK shot us down. Um, we had a cast, we had every, it looked like it was gonna go. Wow. Kirshner was, was, was unflapped, you know. He said, that's the way it goes, you know, I'm just gonna write another one. And that's the movie yeah. biz. Did you find that writing for the movies has any impact on your writing your novels? I know that writing your novels has an impact on doing screenplays, but does it work the other way? Well, it has for me. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's taught me, it, it's taught me that you can, you can oversee a story differently, especially the part about, well, I need to know the chronology of everything that happens, of course. Right. But sometime after that trajectory, I need to make a decision as to what the order in which the reader or the audience should receive that information is, which is not necessarily chronologically. Mm -hmm. I need to know the difference between the audiences or the readers chronology, the way they're gonna learn the story, um, as opposed to seeing it in a linear fashion. You have to see it in a linear fashion first. Right. But the choice of not telling it in a linear fashion. Right. That is informed by the first thing. And nothing has helped me with writing fiction, with writing novels as much as writing screenplays for that thing, that okay. idea of, yes, that's how the story happens. That's what happens and that's what happens next because that happens, that's what happens at the end. Duh, okay. But thinking of a better way for an audience to stumble into this is another game altogether and I, I have often written original screenplays that sit around because they're not made into films. I rewrite them. Well, if they sit around long enough, I begin to think about, you know, because the, the movie is a window of time as an original right. screenplay. Right. I begin to think about I wonder what happened to him. Oh, I love that. 15 years before he got here. And this, from the moment you start thinking that way, that's a novel. That's a novel. That's Suddenly, a novel. And so this screenplay that's been on your desk because nobody's been smart enough to make it, and you're already angry at it because you, you, you wouldn't keep going back to it if someone had made it. Right. It would be gone. It would be off your desk, out of your life. Goodbye. But it's there so i've written i've written now three novels no four that began as screenplays that weren't made into movies and they sat around long enough and i one day i saw oh my god if we met her when she was a child um and what happens to him 40 years from now well, that's a novel. That's no, a novelist mind. It, it's um, it's been hugely useful to me. I, I I really love it, and you know I'm my day job will always be writing novels. I like that better. Um, but I'm always working on a couple of screenplays or. Um, teleplays. Uh, there's a teleplay in progress now for Until I Find You, which I always thought oh, was great. The most ambitious of potential miniseries of my novels. I'm not writing it. Oh, you're not? Okay. It, it, it was someone else's idea, um, but they're good. And, and so I'm consulting and um, uh, I'm excited about that. I am writing Garp, or I'm writing it for now, 
but I've only written five episodes. And if someone comes along and says, you know, I was thinking more like 18 episodes, or someone comes along and says, how about 12? I'll say, be my guest. <laughs> <laughs> because I purposely wrote it as it's kind of bookends. I, right. I wrote, this is how it ends. This is how it begins. Right. And there's, there's five episodes here. Um, there's five 55 minute episodes. Well, there's a lot you could put in the middle. There's a lot of the book I didn't touch. And it's, it's it, between these bookends, um, this is somebody could write a lot more episodes. No, I, I won't. I've, I've made a kind of template. If okay. they want to use it, fine. If somebody comes along and says, I want to go back and, 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 and do it the way you did it in the book. I want to tell the whole thing chronologically. Well, if, if, if they want to write 18 episodes and I only want to write five, <laughs> see a way to do it. I'm not going to stand in the way. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, you know, let me know how I can help, you know, but, but um, it's, what I'm saying is that the process of seeing a story a different way, how can that not help you? Right. How can right. you not That's right. That? And, That's right. And so what, what I had thought at the time you know, the two, three years I put into a screenplay of, of Setting Free the Bears, which I lost the rights to. Um, the book you and lost this, the rights? And it was never made. You know, that bitterness has turned into something I, I really uh, can use. And, and, and there was a, actually, speaking of emotional or psychological payoffs, there was one I remember when Cider House was made. Um, uh, I remember seeing it um, at the Toronto Film Festival, you know, a couple of months before we opened in theaters. It was the last festival I saw it in where the director and I could still tweak it. We could still... Mm -hmm you know, find another angle, cut, cut a line of dialogue here or there. We thought we could still lose four or five minutes. Um, it had been to Deauville, it had been to Venice. The Toronto was the last festival. And, um, and the, the last time we got to see it with an audience before we had to, okay, make a final cut. Um, and, um, and, I remember being in the, in, the, in the balcony where we were screening it. And uh, at the end of the film, there was this tall, crazy looking guy with um, a, a hair longer than mine and whiter than mine, uh, uh, down to his shoulders. And he climbed over one balcony railing into our balcony. Um, and I had not seen Irvin Kirshner for a long time, my director for wow years. Um, and then I recognized him. And he said, way to go, kid. <gasps> <laughs> and oh, that's so great. Really, it, it meant everything. Because wow, of course I, it did. I, and I, my you know, heart. <laughs> He was still, I didn't want him to kill himself between the balconies. <laughs> Barely sort of touched. Um, and, and I, and I said, you, you, you taught me how to do this. Um, and he said, I know. <laughs> That's all. Like, I know. I don't know. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> That's hilarious and totally wonderful. Oh my goodness. I hate to say this, but we have just time for one more um, question for you because I really, I could talk to you for the next two weeks um, because I just want to know if you couldn't give us a shout out to a bookstore that you love and tell us why. Because that's something a Mighty Blaze does. We're trying to really help all the bookstores in existence. And I know you have one in Toronto that you like. 
Well, there are there are a lot of bookstores in in in, in Toronto that I, I I I like. This is a wonderful city for bookstores, and it's a wonderful city for walking. And uh, somehow I, I I connect that with going to bookstores. Um, uh, uh, but my my favorite bookstore. In, in Toronto was was in trouble um, uh, before the uh, pandemic. Um, uh, ben McNally books on Bay Street is, mm -hmm. is a great, great bookstore. Uh, and, and Ben and his uh, son uh, have run it uh, wonderfully. But, but Ben found out um, our, before the coronavirus, that that he was going to have to move, that um, his landlord was going to renew his lease, and um, uh, and uh, he was going to have to find a a new location. So, I mean, already he had a problem. Um, and now, of course, the the the, the bookstore is 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 closed, but. But it's not only close, he still doesn't have a, a location uh, for Ben McNally books to, to reopen uh, in. And, um, and I, I, I love that bookstore and I'm very fond of Ben uh, personally. And I uh, really wish him, but all the bookstores in, in, in Toronto, the, uh, the, the best. It's um. It's a it, it's a big, it's a big reading city. There's there's some there's, there's some great bookstores here, but my my, um, uh, heart goes out to Ben McNally particularly because uh, he's a really good guy. He had a terrific store and, um. And. He got hit with two problems all at once. Well, we had a mighty blazer thinking of doing fundraisers for indie bookstores. So we are going to keep that in mind because it is hard for them. It's really hard for them. It is. And, it is very hard. and you know, they're my heart and they need to be supported. Um, I want to say that this has been truly one of the peak experiences of my life, John. I never, I mean, I've been reading everything of yours for years and I never thought I would get a chance to talk to you. And it's been more interesting and fascinating and I've learned more than I ever thought that I, that I would. And I wanna thank you. I know you're really, really busy for taking time out, first of all, to support a mighty blaze. Second of all, to allow me to interview you. Thank and you. Um, I know everybody out there has a favorite John Irving book. I know I have about 12 of them. And if you don't have your favorite John Irving book, you should go out and buy multiple copies of them because you can never have too many and give them to your friends and your family. Um, I want to thank you again, John. And I want to thank everybody for joining us here at the Mighty Blaze and for shedding light in these dark times. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, John.